Welcome back, guys, to the 21 Convention. Before our next speaker was uh, teaching pickup with Neil Strauss himself for a couple years, he was actually training law enforcement and military personnel how to kill. Without further ado, here's Bravo, the man himself. Thank you for that awesome introduction, which I helped write. Um, all right. Before I got into pickup, I was actually a full-time firearms instructor. Uh, I'm a CCW instructor. I have three NRA certifications. I'm a taser instructor, edge weapon instructor, low light. I went around and helped teach various military and law enforcement, uh, SWAT teams, special forces group, hostage rescue, room clearing, all that kind of fun stuff. Did this just go out or is it still on? Still on. Okay. So when I actually, I got divorced too, and that's how I got into this whole pickup stuff. But beforehand, this is what I did. And we were talking about doing a cool like self-defense awareness and also how to pick your first firearm. So I was really trying to put all that together in this presentation. If you guys have questions when I'm going through this stuff, I'm going to try to have a large Q&A section at the end. So write them down don't, so you don't forget them. And I'm happy to answer as much as I can. Um, first off, who here has ever fired a gun in their life before? Raise your hand. Awesome. Um, I'm from Arizona, which is a pretty pro-gun place. So that's pretty cool. Uh, how many people here have ever studied martial arts before? Raise your hand. All right. Hopefully I don't make any of you mad when I rip on some of the, the bad ones. <laughs> Anyways, when I first got into um, tactical training, this is something I always thought was, if you cannot protect yourself or your loved ones, you're not a man. And you guys all heard about that court case a little bit ago where the two drug dealers like kidnapped the wife, went to the bank, pulled out all this money, went and did meth, came back, raped the wife, raped the kids, set the house on fire. The husband got out, and then he lived. Everyone else died. That whole court case just recently happened. One of the senator's houses just got broken into like two, three days ago, and it was the grandson that came out with a shotgun and like actually protected him with a gun. So that was always one of my things was if I can't protect myself, I can't protect the people I care about, I just didn't feel complete. So I took this on my own to figure out how to defend myself, how to defend my loved ones. And if you guys want to do that too, if especially with doing a firearm, the, I get to ask this all the time, what should you do? go to a, a range and actually pay someone to teach you how to do it. Just like I got a motorcycle a little bit ago. I didn't just go down to the dealership, hop on it, and ride home. I went to a riding class, learned how to do it responsibly, so that way I don't kill myself or kill someone else. This thing blew me away when I learned this. The police have no duty to protect you. It's a little hard to see, but that's a really overweight police officer eating a turkey leg. And I have no confidence that someone like that is going to come to my rescue and help me. And most of us have seen officers where they're pretty overweight and out of shape, and you think they're going to be there and help you out. My brother's actually a cop. My ex-father-in-law is a cop. I've trained more than I can count. My brother's also a lawyer and a firefighter. That's what I had to compete with growing up. Um, but this blew me away when I learned this, because we're all, we're all brought up to think that when you call 911, the cops are going to come there and help you. Well, that's if they get there. They might be dealing with something down the street, and my brother would tell me that he would get a call and it would take 20, 30 minutes before he'd get to the house. So the whole time he's thinking, like, hopefully they can make it until then. So when we're teaching the CCW classes, we get into this kind of stuff. And what I would recommend is you guys, when you get home, all Google this phrase, the police have no duty to protect, and just read all the shit that comes up. But these are the two big ones, and this is actually from the ACLU website, which I don't like the ACLU, just to show you how the other people besides crazy gun guys think about this. Jessica Gonzalez versus the USA, and I'll just read it to you guys real quick. June 1999, Jessica Gonzalez's three daughters, aged seven, nine, and 10, were abducted by her estranged husband and killed after the Colorado police refused to enforce a restraining order against them. Although Gonzalez repeatedly called the police, telling them of her fears for her daughter's safety, they failed to respond. Hours later, Gonzalez's husband drove his pickup truck to the police department and opened fire. He was shot dead by the police. The slain bodies of the three girls were subsequently discovered in the back of his pickup truck. Gonzalez filed a lawsuit against the police, but in June 2005, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled she had no constitutional right to police enforcement of her restraining order. That sucks, because you think, you know, like everything we've heard, get a restraining order, that's going to keep them away. But the cops can only enforce it if they see the person there. So a lot of times they'll call and say, hey, so-and-so's at my house, I have an order against them. By the time the cops show up, they're already gone, nothing they can do. So the cops can only enforce the laws if they see them being broken. Now some of you guys might be thinking too, well, I don't have restraining orders, I don't have to worry about that. What about someone else? 
Warren versus the District of Columbia, March 16th, 1975. Carolyn Warren and Joan Talaferro, who were roommates, and Maureen Douglas and her four-year-old daughter, who were, lived on another floor, were awakened by the back door being broken down by two men, later identified as Marvin Kent and James Morse. They entered Douglas's second floor room, where Kent forced Douglas to sodomize him, <laughs> and then raped her. So that's fucked up, obviously, with the sodomize. That's extra fucked. Warren and Telefino heard Douglas's screams from the floor below, and they called the police. They ended up going outside, like the balcony. There's like this adjoining roof. They waited outside and actually watched a police car do a slow drive-by past the back of the house. The cops never even got out. They just drove by real slow. Another officer knocked on the front door, but left when no one answered a few minutes later. So they called the police a second time, saying, what the fuck? Someone's getting raped and attacked. Come back here. Well, that, one, that 911 call got miscategorized as an investigate trouble and was never even dispatched. A little while later, after the screaming stopped, they thought the police were there. They called down, which ended up alerting Kent of their presence. For the next 14 hours, they were raped, robbed, beaten, and forced to commit sexual acts upon one another, and the four-year-old daughter was there. After this all happened, they left. They ended up recovering, calling for help, sued the police department. The court held that the police are not liable for failure to provide adequate police protection. So it sucks, but you're on your own. You gotta learn how to defend yourself. You gotta learn how to take care of yourself. And then afterwards, what I always recommend is then calling the police and letting them know, hey, I just used my gun or whatever, and then deal with it. That's at least my thought, because I've trained a lot of cops, and I don't feel safe around a lot of them. So how can we defend ourselves? So the first step is to actually be aware, and they have the different levels of awareness. The first one is white, unaware and oblivious to your surroundings. And I'm going to give you guys the first analogy for this, and I want you guys to help me out with another one. But white, people who are in the level of awareness it's white, that's like the people who drive in their car and they run out of gas. Has anyone here ever run out of gas driving their car? I heard a couple Snickers. Okay, I've never done that. That's, I can't even understand how people do that. But it's also like maybe you're just not paying attention for a minute and you miss your exit. So that makes a little bit more sense too. So if you're just zoning out for a minute, that's white. But really, white is like when you're asleep and you're totally not aware of what's going on. And another good example would be the girl who's jogging with her iPod on at night down the street. Like anyone can come up behind her and grab her. She has no way of even knowing what's going on. But let's stick with the car analogy. So yellow is aware of your surroundings and you're alert to new information. So does anyone have a, a, an example of like a yellow state of awareness if you're driving your car? Driving down the street, the lights are red. Perfect. Driving down the street, you see the light actually change instead of just running it, and you see it beforehand. So a highway analogy would be, I know my exit's coming up, so I get over like a mile beforehand. Okay? But that was right on. Orange. So this one is you're in possible danger and you're preparing to act. So for this one, maybe you're driving down the freeway and all of a sudden people start slamming on their brakes ahead of you. You haven't slammed on your brakes yet, but you're starting to like think like, uh-oh, something's going on. And then finally, red. Fight or flight, fee, flee, defend, or attack. So this is, so you're slamming on your brakes. Someone's next to you. You're maybe putting your hand out to stop them from sliding out. You're trying to swerve around or something. You're acting. Or you could also, they have another color that um, the Marines and other people used to is black, where people just freeze totally, and they do nothing. So this is the type of person who like, sees people, the brake lights going on, they don't even react. They just freeze and slam into a full force, which you guys have seen car accidents before. It happens a lot. So for being aware of your surroundings, the, the example for this would be white, we're out at the bar, we're never in white. Yellow, we're aware of our surroundings. So maybe you're in the bar and you see like this big group of guys kind of dressed up like thugs and gangbangers or whatever come in. And you just happen to notice it because you're already scanning it. And then when they get your attention, you focus on them, now you're in orange. Maybe they're making a, a ruckus, making a lot of noise, acting dumb stuff starts throwing around, now you're like in heavy orange and you're like, okay, I might have to act in a second. And then when the fight breaks out and you gotta either get out of the bar or fight, defend yourself or whatever, that would be red. Um, another thing too would just be at your home. Like I was at home with my ex-wife and it was like two in the morning and I always used to come home and I had an ankle holster, I would take it off and I would always set it down uh, on my nightstand because when I went to sleep I liked having it next to the bed. 
So it was like midnight, two in the morning, something, we're watching TV, and all of a sudden, boom, boom, boom on the front door. And I freaked out. I thought it was like a home invasion or something. And I go running over, I get up and I go running to where uh, I normally keep the gun and I didn't have it there. I put it somewhere else. So for a good like 30 seconds, I'm looking around my house, fucking where is it? Boom, boom, boom on the front door. And I'm freaking out. Finally, I get it. I go over to the front door and I go, who is it? And as I look through the peephole, it's covered up. So I couldn't even fucking see who it was. So I'm fucking freaking out. Like orange, I'm, I'm preparing to act. And then all of a sudden the thumb comes off and it's like two high school girls. And they're like, oh, is Carrie here? And they'd had the wrong house. So they were fucking kicking on my door. And also, too, one of my friends in high school, one of my best friends, um, pounded on his door. He just opened it because he thought it was his cousin. Didn't even look. Two guys came in and did a home invasion on him. Shotguns. Took him down. Tied him up with an extension cord. Tied up his little cousin with an extension cord. Kicked the guy in the head. They thought he had all this money. He did, like, flooring, like vinyl flooring, so he's not rolling in the dough at all. And uh, they ended up trying to go over to the stove and heat up spoons on the stove. And they were going to burn him and torture him. And luckily, they were idiots, and they turned on the oven and not the stove, and they couldn't figure out how to fucking use it. And after a while, they got tired, and they ended up leaving. But right after that, he came to one of my gun classes after. He was like, fuck, I can never let that happen again. And actually, right after it happened, too, he went outside. They left. They took his car keys. They took off his phone and everything. He goes outside, and he's in this nice building. There's a security guard going around. And he's like, I just fucking got robbed. The guys had guns pointed at me. Like, my friends are still tied up. I just got robbed. And the security guard wouldn't even call 911 because he's like, I can't get involved. you got to call 911. So even worse than the police not taking care of us is they can't be held liable for not doing their job. Security officers are pretty dumb, most of us who know those guys and see them at Walmart and shit. But uh, they won't even fucking call the police because they're like, oh, I can't be involved. They're just there as a presence. They're instructed not to get involved. So you're really on your own. So martial arts training. And this to me is being aware is number one because if you're aware... You can always avoid this stuff. And I had one of my students, one of my PUA students was talking to me and he said, uh, oh, I was, in this, I was out at the beach and some guy wanted to fight me and I was like, no, I didn't want to fight and he ended up believing. And he goes, and afterwards I just felt like the biggest pussy because I, I backed down. And I had to explain to him, I was like, dude, what did, you, what did you want to have happen that night? Did you want to get in a fight or did you want to not get in a fight and walk away? And he goes, I didn't want to get in a fight, I wanted to walk away. I go, okay, so your decision of the outcome that you wanted is what happened. Why is that a problem? And even me, like, I'm, I've done a couple cage fights years ago. I've done Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I've done Kali. I've done a lot of stuff, which I'm going to get into in a second. But even me, if I'm out, I don't want to fucking get in a fight because someone could just pull a knife out, one of his buddies I don't see, one little poke, and it could be over. I could be really fucked up. And you guys have all seen those YouTube videos of people pounding on someone and just stomping them and fucking them up and knocking their teeth out and all this crazy shit. I don't have anything to prove, so I never have a problem walking away from anything. But if I need to defend myself, if someone draws me to that level... Yeah, I've done enough training with knife, guns, empty hand. I'll probably be okay. But martial arts training, bad news, guys. We were lied to. Karate kid, crane kick, none of that shit works. <laughs> you guys all watch UFC? Yes? Okay. Did you guys ever watch the old UFCs? We were talking about this earlier. Okay, when it was style versus style. And you learned really hard and fast what worked and what didn't. And the Jet Li... Taekwondo, none of that stuff works. My argument is, if that stuff worked, George St. Pierre would be using it. All these guys would be using it. Now, people might say Anderson Silva did the little jump kick and stuff recently. That's just a front kick, That's not, and so did uh, Machida, but that's nothing crazy. So doing stuff like this and waiting for them doesn't work. And also, a lot of martial arts are complete bullshit because they'll teach, and I studied it for years, too. The guy throws the punch, you block, you step out of the line of attack, trap, strike, grab, throw down. You don't get to do six moves, and the guy does one move, and he just freezes there and waits for you to do all this stuff. <laughs> you guys have seen this in the, any boxing UFC. It's one move for one move. It's like checkers or chess. It's back and forth. So if the guy throws the punch, and you trap it, or even parrying it in boxing, you'll very rarely see guys in the UFC be able to just parry and push it down. But Taekwondo, tanks, I did Tang Sudo when I was a kid. I did Aikido Jiu Jitsu, which is a forerunner to Aikido, and Kin Jitsu, which is a forerunner to Kendo. So it's even more like old school and traditional. Man, we used to like block, and it was like 12 moves or something. And like, really, the guy's going to stand there? It's horrible. So if you are going to study martial art, look at any of the stuff that works. Brazilian jiu-jitsu is my number one. Learn a striking system, so boxing, boxing or kickboxing. And then also, obviously, weapons. I'm a big fan of uh, Filipino martial arts. So Kali, Lacoste, Escrima, any of those kind of arts. 
Um, I did Syat Kali for a while, and I saw one of the guys last year wearing the Syat Kali shirt up here in the, when you go to the website. That's awesome stuff. And one of the guys I trained for is like, I think the only American guy who's like actually an instructor in like four different Kali systems. And those are pretty fucking nasty things. Those like stick fighting, knife fighting. I've broken my nose multiple times. I've been tased, I've been pepper sprayed. I've been in some crazy shit. But uh, doing the Kali training was like one of the hardest, most difficult things I've ever done. And it's awesome, I love it. So one of my friends just emailed me four or five days ago, a guy from high school too, and he goes, oh, my uh, fiance, we wanna get like a weapon for when she's walking her dog. Because we're worried about her being able to like defend herself, take care of the dog, if there's like a pit bull rolling around. And who just, someone just had to shoot a pit bull the other day? Okay, so someone just had to shoot a dog. And once again, YouTube this shit. You can see the police officers having to fight like a pit bull and stuff. And it's insane how, how fast they are. And so, less lethal force options. I, I was going to say no one here is a cop, but actually there is someone. But for most of us, we aren't police. We don't have a job where we actually have to apprehend someone. I don't have to take someone into custody. My only job is to defend myself and my loved ones. So I don't need less lethal force options. Because if I have less lethal and someone has lethal and I'm gonna pepper spray someone who has a knife or a gun, that's insane. And also, if I'm justified in using a taser or a stun gun or pepper spray on someone because I'm in fear of my safety, more than likely, I'm justified in using lethal force also. So less lethal force options, and I'm sure you guys know a lot about these, pepper spray, people get it for their girlfriends, they put it in the bottom of the purse, how long is it gonna take you to pull it out? And even cops don't even like pepper spray because what happens is they spray it and the wind's going around, everyone gets cross-contaminated. They usually don't practice with that much, so they'll spray it. And have you guys ever done it with deodorant or cologne where you go, and it misses it totally? Okay, so imagine pepper spray. I've been pepper sprayed in our fucking store I worked at. One of our customers was like, let me see this, and accidentally just blasted me right in the face. And I used to train with Collie and they'd pepper spray us and his with sticks and all that too when we trained through it. But this is when I was younger. And uh, he's just sitting there and I'm paying attention and right in my face. So if you can do that on accident, when there's zero stress, when you're like fighting something or a dog's coming at you, the girl's not gonna be able to dig in her purse, pull this thing out that she's never practiced with, undo the button, flip to safety, and then spray it and know where that line of attack's gonna be. So I'm not a fan of pepper spray. And some people keep it in the car or something, but the heat in Arizona can make it blow up. Then you can't fucking go in your car. Um, and it's so powerful too that someone sprayed it in the trash can at our gun range before, which is like a 40,000 square foot warehouse. And then we had to like almost evacuate the whole building. It was so fucking bad. People were coughing and stuff. Uh, people say mace, but mace is a chemical. Pepper spray stronger, and it just comes from peppers. O OC, olestrine, capsulate. And it's like two million Scoville heat units, which is I think like a jalapeno is like a hundred or something or a thousand. And then if you guys ever watch Man vs. Food, where he eats like the ghost chili and it's like a, a million or something. So yeah, pepper spray. They have like two million, five million. It's insane. And when my brother got hit with it, he said it was through the police academy, he said it was the worst thing he's ever done. And he's, he was Mr. Teen Arizona as a bodybuilder, he's a cop, he's a cage fighter, he's done way more cage fights than me. And um, he got hit with it and said it was the worst thing he's ever been through. It wasn't that bad for me. I was able to like totally function through it. Now, Taser was fucking horrible for me, and he thought it wasn't that bad. So it also shows you that if someone gets zapped with something, it might not even be that effective. And you're used to seeing something, pss, the guy's gonna freak out. Well, if he's on drugs, if he's very determined, if they're drunk, or if they're just one of the people who doesn't affect them as much, it's worthless. And just counting like your life and safety on some pepper spray that's been sitting in your purse for five years, insane. So my friend who's doing these walks, he asked about stun guns. And he's like, well, I don't want to carry like pepper spray, but maybe a stun gun. And I was like, dude, like a pit bull's coming at you and you just want to shock it? And go like bad dog? Because they have like shock collars for dogs. That's all it is. It's to, you have a shock collar to teach a dog not to bark. When it barks, it zaps them on the neck after a few zaps. They'll quit barking. I was like, that's not going to stop them. I used to get stun guns and to show people how worthless they were when they'd buy them and come to our range. I would just zap myself and hold it in the leg. I even did a, a field report on this old style I formed when I was there. I was like, stun gun DHV. And I would just go, zzz, and I'd go, yeah, this wouldn't stop me. But people think because of the movies that you get zapped with a stun gun and you go, zzz, and you fall and hit the ground. But if you think about it, it only has these little metal electrodes that are that big. So when you zap it, it only is going to affect that muscle area. So the taser... See, I perfectly say going into that. The taser is stronger. It's on a different frequency where it actually overloads the muscles to where like, you, when I got hit, it felt like the worst muscle cramp I ever had. And I couldn't control any muscles like on my ankle and on my shoulder. And I went on my tiptoes, my calves fucking cramped up. And it felt like I was getting hit with like baseball bats every time it cycled. It was fucking horrible. 
took everything I had not to scream like a girl when I got zapped because I was around all my friends. And this is before every police department was carrying them and stuff too because the rep came in. He's like, oh, yeah, we sell tasers. I'm like, those are fucking worthless. That's not going to work. And then right then we were setting up our, our TV with the DVD in it of this guy, Hans Marrero, who I've trained also with him. He was the former chief hand-to-hand -hand instructor for the Marines. And in this video, he's getting ready to get zapped as they're setting up my zap. This, we hit play on this, and he gets zapped, and it, he's like huge and buff, and he goes, oh, and he stops, stop, and they turn it off. And they go, how does this compare to other things you've been hit? And he goes, oh, I got hit with a grenade once. And he turns around, has this giant scar on his back. And they go, what'd you do? He goes, oh, it knocked me unconscious, but I woke up. He goes, it dislocated my knee. I popped my knee back in place, duct taped it, and continued on. But he's like, that's the worst thing I've ever been through. And then like five seconds later, they're like, all right, Steve, you ready to get zapped? And I was like, oh, fuck, what did I get myself into? But it's also, the, the electrodes are spread out, so anything that's in between it gets affected. So it's a larger surface area. So stun guns, bzz, and then also tasers, you can do a dry stun, where if you take the cartridge off, or if you shoot and miss, you can hit them with the front of it, and you do dry stuns with it. But again, it's only hitting that muscle area. So if someone has a knife, and they're in contact range, and the knife can reach my throat, and all I'm gonna do is zap them in the stomach, and they'll go bzz, ow, and they'll bend over, now it's not making contact anymore, it's having no effect, ow, now they slip my throat and I'm dead, not a good defense. And I even zap my ex, Maybe that's why she's my ex, but I zapped her in the butt once with it at work with a stun gun. And she just thought it was a rubber band hitting her. She was like, ow, what was that? But people, because they're trained from the movies and everything, you think a stun gun hits you, and the guy goes, uh, and falls and hits the ground. Doesn't work like that. Another thing is ASP, which is the collapsible baton. It's a brand of a baton. Um, people have PR-24s to side handle batons and stuff, baseball bats. Again, those are nice, but even the police, a lot of guys I know don't even like them because you have to strike, and they really aren't that... the best sticks, like to actually like stick fight with. Um, they only use them for pain compliance, generally, so they're hitting like muscle areas and stuff. And if someone is, if there's a crazy guy with a knife, and you'll see this if you see pictures or videos, there's a crazy guy with a knife and someone has a baton and they're trying to like knock the knife out of their hand, or they have like a taser and they're pointing it at them, there's al always multiple other officers with their guns drawn at the bad guy. So then they're trying to like take the guy out without having to kill him, but if he makes a move, they're all going to have to unload with them. And even then, that's when, they, when the law enforcement officers will, will deploy these. They're only going to use their taser if other people are right there with shotguns and handguns. So if someone's coming at me with a knife, I'm not going to go, let me zap them and hopefully they learn their lesson, or let me pepper spray them and hopefully they can't see me for a second. So less lethal force options, really take it off the table for civilians because you're either defending yourself or you're getting out of there. So the next one is, Lethal force options. Now, how many people uh, carry a pocket knife? Raise your hand. Yeah, I saw one last night. There's four or five. Okay, I like knives. I'm a big fan of them. But you guys have all heard that old saying, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. So I don't know if you can see it. It's the Indiana Jones scene where he shoots the guy with the sword. <laughs> Do you guys know about that scene? He, originally, he trained for weeks and weeks and like months with the whip. He was going to like disarm the guy and everything. But I guess he had food poisoning that week, and he was like, I can't do it. And he's like, he has a gun. Why does he fucking just shoot him? And so they ended up using that scene. But anyways, uh, don't bring a knife to a gunfight, but also don't bring a gun to a knife fight. And this is stuff we used to teach. Really close quarters, if I have a gun out, all it takes is my gun going off a couple degrees, and it's not going to make contact. It's not even going to hit the guy. But a knife up close can keep working, keep working. It doesn't run out of ammo. doesn't malfunction. It's not a jam. It's a malfunction. And uh, up close, there's definitely a lot of advantages to knives. But I'm not going to get into knife stuff. On brakes, if you guys want to talk any more about it, we can. Uh, but even if the gun runs out of ammo, you can still hit someone upside the head with it. Right, but the baton would be a better striking instrument, and I don't even really want to do that. So I prefer guns. It's Dirty Harry with his gun. So I don't want anyone to answer, necessarily, who shot firearms or anything before. But between the two of these, this revolver, and these are real pictures too. So this revolver right here, or this big revolver, which one do you think actually kicks more? And actually, we'll do like a raise of hands. Who here thinks the uh, small one, the black one, if you shoot that gun, that one's going to kick more than the big one? Raise your hand. Okay. Now, if we are shooting the large one, uh, who thinks that one's going to kick more, have more recoil? One, two, three, four. Okay. Actually, these are both chambered in 38 Special. And 38 Special is just a type of bullet. It's for revolvers. 38 Special, 357 Magnum is a bigger version of that. These are both 38 Specials. That's it. That's all they can shoot. So if the small gun is shooting the same bullet as the big gun, 
And that's actually the, the, the ankle gun I carry. It's a titanium alloy, nice, small, super lightweight one. Uh, that's a five shot J frame. This is a full size six or seven shot. They both shoot the same bullet. Well, that one's a lot lighter. And every action has an opposite and equal reaction. So when you're shooting the gun, the, explode, the primer goes off, it ignites the powder, shoots the bullet out. The bullet's also pushing back on you. So if I have a lot more weight and mass to absorb it, it's actually going to kick less. So there's a gun that almost looks exactly like this. And it's silver. And then there's a wood grip. This is a nice soft rubber grip, but there's like a real thin little wood grip on it. And they call it a Lady Smith. And people would come into our gun range all the time, girls, and they go, oh, I want to buy a Lady Smith because it's a Lady Smith. And I would go, that fucking thing like, isn't fun to shoot at all, right? That little gun back there that you got a blister on your thumb. Not fun to shoot lightweight ones like this. Like They hurt. I had my ex-wife shoot that a couple times. Five shots, it brought her to tears because it hurt so much in her hand. But it's a carry gun, so you always got to balance it out. So people would buy that little gun because they're like, well, I don't want a big one. Like, ah, I'm not gonna... But if you're not going to carry it, why not get something bigger? Which we'll get into more in a second. But this is what happens is people who don't know anything about firearms end up feeling this like right to make laws about guns and telling other people who, what they can and can't do with guns. Like in Arizona, they recently changed the law to where you can take firearms into places that serve alcohol. So restaurants, bars, stuff like that. Everyone's freaking out because they're like, oh my God, it's going to be fucking crazy. People are going to go nuts and start shooting everyone. Well, the people who already have that mindset are already going to be doing that stuff. The people who follow the laws and aren't idiots aren't going to do that. So everyone will say, oh, all the, it's going to be horrible. Everyone's going to be shooting up the place. Well, it happened a couple months ago. Nothing's happened at all. And anyone who gets into gun stuff, this is actually what got me to like get into p politics and stuff, is just learning about how crazy and dumb so much of this gun stuff is. Like the high-capacity gun mag ban, which just one day they're like, eh, you can't have a, a mag in a semi-automatic gun that holds more than 10 bullets. Like, who came up with that? There's no data to back it up. Just someone pulled that number out of their ass. And that went from 1994 to 2004. There's no data backing up that had any effect whatsoever on it. So then they let it sunset and it came back and everyone's like, oh, high capacity mags. These are uh, assault weapons and all this stuff. ARs, it's all horrible. It came back. None of the crime rate went back up or anything like that. California and a couple other places still have the law to where you have to have a 10 round mag, less bullets in your gun. But again, it doesn't show anything. And the bad guys can buy standard capacity mags, not high cap mags. They can buy them from other states and bring them back to California and carry them illegally when they're going to rob people. But only the good guy is going to go, well, shit, I can't have a 13-round mag. i got to go buy a 10-round mag. So my point with this is if you're going to start making choices about firearms, learn about it. So at least have the knowledge to learn about it. Have the knowledge before you make a decision on it. So how many guys have seen a gun like this, either in a movie or real life, an old school 1911? Awesome gun. They went out of uh, Vogue for a while. A lot of people said, oh, we don't like them and stuff. But a lot of guys have actually been bringing them back. Like, I think LAPD SWAT was using them. Uh, the Marine Det 1, uh, Detachment 1, MARSOC unit. They started going with a the gun. They had Kimber specially build one. A lot of people are bringing these back, these uh, 1911s. I'm not a big fan of them because it's an old school handgun where it's a metal grip with the grips actually screwed into it. And the grip is what they call, um, well, the magazine is what they call a single stack mag, where it's just one roll of bullets. So this one could have like seven or eight rounds in it. It's 45 ACP, which is a semi-automatic. We'll have a bullet chart in a second. But I just don't like it because it's real big and heavy, and you don't get that, many, that much capacity with it. It's also what they call a single action gun. You guys have ever seen the old cowboy movies where the guy would pull out his gun and shoot like this? Yes? OK, and you ever see it in the movie where they go click? Right? That's single action then. So what they're doing is, like this actually, this hammer's down right now. If you inserted a magazine, chamber it around, when the action slides back, that hammer's gonna get cocked. So it then is in single action mode. What single action means is when I press the trigger straight to the rear, that performs one function. It drops the hammer down. It performs one single function. The round then exits the barrel. It slides, it chambers another round, it kicks out the spent casing. If you guys watch Matrix, all the casings come flying out. That kicks out and it chambers another bullet. And as it cycles, it recocks the hammer. So when this came out, old school cowboy guns, you always had to cock it each time. And then that last slide, this one has a hammer on it right here. Now, if I do this and actually have the gun in my hand in that position and I press the trigger to the rear, it's actually going to pull the hammer back with it. And then as it hits that certain point, it's going to release it and it's going to fire. And that would actually be called a double action trigger press. 
if I pull the hammer back, the trigger also goes back a little bit further and it goes from like a 15 pound trigger press to like a two pound trigger press. So a lot of people who aren't familiar with guns, when they go out to the gun range, they get it and they cock it up here, which is very unsafe. You only do it when you're on range. And really, I wouldn't do it at all. That's why my revolver actually doesn't have a hammer on it at all. It's double action all the time. That way when I'm drawing it, this hammer doesn't get snagged on anything maybe on the way out. Also, if that hammer gets jammed up with anything, the gun won't fire. So that's why I like the revolver without it because it's one trigger pull, it always works. Single action on the 1911. This one has a safety. A lot of people are like, oh, certain guns don't have safeties. Glocks don't have safeties. I'll get to in a second. And they freak out. But revolvers don't have safeties. That was a new feature. And it really came out with this gun because when it would cock, it's now in single action mode. And basically, it just took a real light press on that trigger for the hammer to come down. So they came up with a grip safety that's right here that basically when you grip onto the gun, it disengages it. And there's also a thumb safety. Sometimes it's on both sides where there's a little lever right here but it's actually on the opposite side of this. And so when you carry a 1911, they'd call it carrying it cocked and locked, which means chambered, cocked, hammer back, but locked the safety on. So then you had a train, when you draw it out of the holster, you have to disengage that safety as you're going on target. It's okay, it's not my favorite thing to do, but that's a 1911, good gun, go out to the gun range, practice with a whole bunch of different ones. Maybe this is the one you like. Kimber, Springfield Armory, they make these really good stuff. Now this is a SIG. Also, this could be an HK, Beretta, a whole bunch of other guns, but this one falls into the double action, single action category. A little different than revolver. What happens with this one is I insert a magazine, I chamber the round, and there's a lever on the other side that lets me sweep it with my thumb and it safely drops the hammer down without discharging the firearm. What happens with this is my very first shot, when I press the trigger to the rear, it has to cock the hammer back, it then releases it, it fires, it then chambers the round, all your follow-up shots now become single action. So your very first trigger pulls, double action. All the follow-up shots are single action. Then when you're done shooting, you have to decock it and put it back in your holster. The problem with this is people buy this gun and they don't practice that first shot because that first trigger press is really hard. They cock it, chamber it, load it, and they practice that at the range. Well, in real life, you might only get one shot off. So you want to practice with what it is. And the, the mindset behind this too is instead of having good training where your finger's always off the trigger until you're ready to fire, they came up with this idea of, well, let's make the trigger pull a little heavier. So that way, if the people are dumb and they're running around with their finger on the trigger, it's not two pounds and it accidentally goes off. It's like 12 pounds, so it's a little bit harder to do your first shot, but all your follow-up shots are easier. Some people like that. I think it's dumb because then you have to master two different trigger pulls. You have to master a whole other step of decocking because I can't holster that firearm with the hammer back. So when I'm done shooting, I always have to decock before I put it back in. Something else you have to worry about, the hammer getting jammed up, like I said before, but two trigger pulls to learn I don't like it. So then some people, they do like SIGs that are double action only, and the HKs and stuff like that too, where the hammer can never get cocked. But to me, it's kind of just a bad idea. So I'm a big fan of double action only, a Glock. That's one example. Uh, Springfield Armory, what model is that? Does anyone have one of those, the grip safety that's a plastic one? XD. XD, there we go. Yeah, that originally came out as like an XD9 or something like that, and then Springfield bought it. Did a little redesign out Springfield Armory and everyone sold it. Good gun too, but Glock was the original one. Basically the same as, as, as this one and a lot of other guns like Sigma was a Glock clone, they did this. This gun's double action only. I'm a big fan of that because there's no hammer. So up close, CQB, you're wrestling for the gun. For some reason it's jammed up against me because I'm fighting someone. There's nothing that's gonna prevent that hammer from coming back. There's nothing that can get in the way of preventing the hammer from coming down and firing. It's always gonna work. The trigger pull on this one is the same every single time. So instead of it being 12 pounds and then two pounds, it's like five and a half across the board, unless you're New York where they put a big spring in it because they don't think their guys are safe and they make them, make them do a heavier trigger pull, it sucks. But anyway, you can actually get a lighter trigger pull too for it, like for the race guns, like a two and a half, three and a half pound. I like the stock one because that's what all the police officers have. Then if you ever use this in real life, also too, if you're buying bullets, I like using the one that either a local police department uses or like the FBI or someone else uses, because then liability-wise later if you're in court, well, how come, how come, uh, how come you're using these bullets on the guy? These are like so nasty and stuff. And I was like, hey, this is the same stuff FBI uses, which the brand they used was Spear Gold Dot. So that way just liability-wise you're covered. But anyways, this one's double action only. The trigger pull is the same every time. And when you load the gun and chamber the round, it's then prepared to fire. 
This one has a little trigger safety, it's called. There's a little tooth in here, and when you actually chamber it, you'll see the little tooth kind of kicks out. And when, as soon as you put your finger on the trigger, that disengages that safety. And I used to do demos with the gun. I would unload it, and I'd be in the range, and I'd put like a Sharpie marker in the trigger, and I would try to like dry fire the gun, which is pressing the trigger to the rear with no ammunition in the gun. I would try to dry fire it, and I couldn't get it. I couldn't get enough leverage and strength. So it's actually pretty hard to do. There's no external safety, but the hammer and all the striker and everything's inside. So there's nothing that's going to accidentally grab it and release it to where the gun goes off. The police departments, when they tested them, they threw them out of the window of cars, ran over them on the freeways, threw them out of a helicopter. None of them went off or anything. And you guys remember the shit years ago, I don't know how old you are, but when they started freaking out about plastic guns going through x-ray machines and stuff, that was the Glock. But once again, that's them being stupid, because if you actually x-ray this, it looks like a fucking gun. And this is all metal, and there's metal all in here. So, <laughs> man, the stuff I've seen, I, one of my buddies got in a shooting once, and actually it was him, and he went to like this private Catholic school, super nice guy, goes to church every week, like one of the nicest guys I've ever met. And his partner, who's a Hispanic guy, this gangbanger was driving a car. They wreck it. They go chasing after him. And the, the bad guy pulled out a gun and tried to shoot my friend. And he ended up shooting him once through the chest. The guy dropped instantly. It actually turned out that his partner, the Hispanic guy, was this guy's cousin. They grew up like together and they knew each other. But in the paper the next day, it was like officers shoot, suspected, whatever. And it's like, you read it and you're like, what the fuck is this? It isn't it. But then real life is... This guy was a gangbanger. He was trying to shoot a cop. And so anytime you ever see the stuff in the news, too, man, like not just say there's a lot of stuff, police stuff I don't like, but anytime you read the stuff in the news, it's just so many dumb things that you, you read about that just aren't true. But I've never seen stuff that is like as crazy as I've seen with the guns. It's when you actually know about this stuff, too, it's just insane. Like, why didn't they shoot him in the leg? Why didn't they shoot him in the arm? Real life, less than 20% of the shots fired hit their target with law enforcement shootings. Most of them occur within I think it's like five yards, three yards, so it's like 15 feet. So less than 20% of shots fired hit their target. They missed the guy completely. So somehow the cop's going to be able to like shoot the knife out of his hand or shoot him in the foot. And even if you shoot someone in the leg, the femoral arteries there, they can still bleed out very quickly. So just very dumb stuff. People have no idea about what real life is trying to come up with this stuff. Caliber selection. A lot of people uh, rip on 9mm and 38 and all that stuff too. That's dumb. This is a 22. This is a 9. That's a 40. And if you look next to each other, there's not a big difference between the two. And a 40 caliber is actually a neck down 10 millimeter. That's like what they're trying to do with like the FBI. It was a 10 millimeter gun. Glock makes a 10 millimeter. 10 millimeter is kind of like a 45, which is that one. But it's just like a newer round because the 45 has been around for a long time 1911, so 100 years. The 9 millimeter isn't that much difference in size. It's a lot cheaper to purchase boxes of ammo. There's less recoil, so you can practice. You're more accurate with it. Also, because it's small, it fits in. You get more rounds in the gun. The Glock that was there, that's a Glock 19. That's my favorite gun. The magazine holds 15 rounds. So the 1911 I talked about earlier maybe has seven or eight. Well, the Glock has 15, and if I got an extra mag or two, it's 30 rounds on my belt. It's pretty nice to have. Uh, nine millimeters is a NATO round, so it's easier to find. Military uses it if shit really hits the fan. Also, I'm super accurate, super fast with the nine. So I tried nines, 40s, I've bought all these guns, and I ended up cycling all the way back to nine. And just to show you guys the difference, 357 Magnum is right there, but that's a revolver round. 38 Special came out first, then they made a 357 Magnum, then they did a 44 Special, and then later came out with a 44 Magnum, which is the Dirty Harry gun. And then nine millimeter, uh, 40 cal, 45. 50 cal, that's the Desert Eagle round. I wanted you guys just to see that. Um, those are all for semi-automatic guns. And the way they work is because they have this little ridge right there. That's what allows the gun to cycle and feed these out. It hooks it, pulls it out, and lets you cycle it over and over, whereas these don't. And you can also see how much bigger this is because that's an older round. The 38 came out way back in the day, and a 38 Special plus P357 Magnum, a 9 millimeter is kind of right in between the both of those, and you can see how much smaller it is. Because as technology gets better, they can make smaller bullets that are more powerful. They actually have one called a 357 SIG, which is a 40 caliber casing with a 9 millimeter put in top, and it's like bottleneck down like a Coke bottle. And that's basically a bullet that's this big with this size, and it's like that powerful, a 357 Magnum. But a lot of these gimmicky rounds that come out, 45 GAP, which is a real small 45 caliber, 
oh wait, 45 caliber. Um, a lot of those, it's just gimmicky rounds. I wouldn't mess with any of that. Wait until they start getting used. If you guys are going to buy guns, find ones that are common, that are out there, that are around for a while, because otherwise you'll buy it and you get burned, because everything's so expensive. So gun selection. We talked about earlier with that big gun and the small gun. What's this gun going to be used for? I don't know if I want to ask this question, but just think about it. If anyone here is going to conceal carry, are you guys going to carry that big ass revolver? Probably not. Also, too, that gun's really big, and it only has like six or seven shots in it. Where I can carry a Glock that's about that big, and has 15 rounds in it. So what am I going to carry? Some people just want a gun for the house. So you're going to keep it in the house next to the nightstand? Then don't do what I dealt with all the time at the gun range, where people would come in, and they're like, oh, I don't want a big gun, I'm just going to keep it in the house. Well, why wouldn't I want a bigger gun that absorbs the recoil more? I don't have to worry about concealing it. It's just going to be for self-defense. So why not have a shotgun? or a big ass handgun, or a full size. So another thing you want to think about is price, because guns start getting kind of expensive. What was your Springfield XD? Do you remember how much it cost? Um, I don't have one. I just know OK, so you're a gun fan then? Yeah. I think they're like five, 600 bucks. Glocks are like, in Arizona, 450, 529, depending on the accessories. So sp plan about spending about $500. HK SIGs, a lot of that, are more expensive. And sometimes you'll go to the gun range and they have like those 1911s that are all tricked out. And that could be like $1,000, $1,500. So find something that's in your price range, but highly, highly recommend going out and shooting it first. Go to the range and try it because nothing's worse than like buying a gun, really liking it, going out to the range and then just hating it. So I mentioned this uh, a second ago, but I want to get more into it. But balancing power and capacity with concealability. So that little small revolver I had in the picture, that only holds five bullets and it's real small, and it fucking kicks like a motherfucker. It's insane. But it's so lightweight that I can carry it almost anywhere. So I can throw it on my ankle and I have it. I have another gun, it's a kel 32, which is a little semi-automatic gun, it's a little, it's real plastic grip, very small, and I can just put that in my pocket in my cargo shorts. If I'm just running to the store, hitting a drive through or something, I can just throw it in my pocket, so I always have something. If I'm dressed in an area that has like colder weather where I can wear jackets and stuff, then obviously I can carry a bigger gun. So you have to think about how you're dressed, how many rounds you want, how powerful you want it to be. Obviously, the more powerful the gun, the bigger it's going to be because it needs to be able to handle that, those larger rounds. Carry options. It's like a garter belt. I think it's like a steampunk chick or something. Like They're kind of bringing it back. And that's a Derringer, which is such a dumb gun to have. But carry options. Generally, people want to carry. You want to carry on your strong side which is your primary side. So if you're right-handed, right side, left hand, left side. Um, ankle holster, obviously there's a higher level of concealability because I can dress like this. I can ride on my motorcycle, I can have it. No one knows I have it, but it's gonna take me more time to get to it. It's also smaller and I have less capacity. So if I have a Glock and they have different holsters, like ones on the outside, then I might have to get like a jacket or untuck my shirt to cover it. They have holsters that go on the inside of the waistband, which then you might have to get bigger pants to accommodate it which then if you care about style, that kind of fucks things up because then you have like baggy pants. Um, small the back holster I'm not a big fan of. Shoulder holsters, they look cool, but really it's not. A lot of times when you're drawing it too, you're kind of covering other areas. It's not the safest. It's also not very secure if you're like wrestling or fighting. But if you're in a seated position a lot of times, then it might be good. Like I was thinking about it on a motorcycle if I needed to like Mad Max someone when I'm driving. But uh, I just bought a Harley a little bit ago too. So that's what a Harley Iron. I posted pictures of it on Facebook. It's all black. It's like nice and small. It's not like a big grandpa bike. But anyways, I was trying to think like carrying on that. I didn't know if my, my ankle was going to work, my ankle holster with my revolver, if I was going to have to go with the Glock and like wear like a riding jacket to cover it up. And I even wore a shoulder holster with my revolver one day just to kind of test it out and see what, what it worked. So I recommend like what's going to happen is if you guys buy a gun, you start carrying it, you're going to have all these different, a drawer full of holsters. Outside the waistband, inside the waistband, shoulder holsters, fanny packs, all this kind of stuff. I would never wear a fanny pack, though, with the gun. <laughs> all right, that was actually my segue, because one of the things I do want to talk about, too, is 80% of shootings occur in low-light situations. So if we could dim the lights for a second, and we're going to kick these off. I want to do a little demo and explain some stuff. And actually, I'm going to have uh, Anthony help me out with this. Turn those all the way off too. 
or you want them off, right? Yeah, now. damn. That one too, please? There we go, perfect. There you go. So he's gonna be my bad guy. And I want us to kind of just get used to the darkness for a second too while I explain this. So first off, you can see that cool picture. That's actually me. I was posing for something for a magazine for a catalog. But I'm actually doing bad stuff with the gun. You'd never have your gun low like that. I'm also backlit. Like I'm actually going in and all the lights are on behind me. That's bad tactics, FYI, if anyone's looking at the picture and critiquing it. I know that. That's for a catalog. But 80% of shootings occur in low light situations. When do predators come out to prey at night? When, are someone, when is someone going to break in your house? Usually at night. When are people drunk and acting stupid? Usually at night. So if you have a firearm, I highly recommend you have a flashlight, a good flashlight with it. And you guys have probably seen those big ass mag lights before, or stream lights, those big ones you can blind people with, you can hit them with it. Those suck, I don't like them. I'm a big fan of these nice small ones, and I'll show you guys more in detail when the lights are back on. But what I want to demo with this is just by having a good flashlight, a lot of times, I, this is all I have. Because if I'm out, yeah, no pictures. If I'm out, or if I, when I was flying here, I can't take a knife with me on an airplane, I can't take my gun with me, but I can have a flashlight with me. And no one is gonna think twice about a flashlight. If I pepper spray someone in the face and I wasn't justified, I can get in trouble. If I stun gun someone, I should have brought all that stuff. I should have pepper sprayed yeah. you and stun gun and tasered you. I, I can get in trouble. But if you shine someone in the eyes with a flashlight, what are they gonna do? They're gonna sound like a bitch if they're whining about that. <laughs> Unless it's this flashlight. So anyways, what I'm gonna do is this demo. Um, take actually one step back and pretend that you are a bad guy with a handgun and you're pointing it at my head. So this is a big problem when I would teach military and law enforcement. They don't know how to use a flashlight properly. So a lot of times they're kind of target fixated and they're looking at the gun and they're shining the flashlight at him, but they're not really like shining it right in his eyes. And of all of our senses, our eyes are really the strongest. That's why a lot of martial arts saying there's like, if you take the eye, you take the body. Pepper spray, you want to hit him in the eyes. If you take the eyes out of the fight, it's pretty nasty. So I'm going to move around and I want you to keep your fingers pointed at me. Good. Yeah, keep pointing at my head. So if I move, you're able to trace me. So just by being smart with this flashlight, if I shine him in the eyes, He's guessing. he can't even see me. Not even close. So when we actually we would do advanced training, when we're coming in rooms, we'd have our flashlights out, we'd keep it away from our body, and we'd strobe and move around the whole room. And this is why I wanted the lights to be off for a second, because you guys get acclimated to it. I'm going to blind everyone for a second just so you can see what this is like. So imagine getting a, someone's trying to get in your face, start a fight, you're in a bar or something, and they can't see you. And this one's really cool too, because it has a strobe feature. <laughs> which is even more fucked up. Lights on? So I remember when I was working at my gun range, this one guy, Ken Good, came in. He works for the company Surefire. If you guys have ever seen those um, weapon mounted lights on the AR 15s and on the shotguns and all that, that's Surefire. That's like the best stuff. The, sh the shotgun light I have is a. Uh, five, six hundred dollars just for the light. But it's a special light. It's really bright, really powerful. This is an LED, so no bulb to burn out. It runs off the three volt lithiums, which are the camera batteries. So they have a 10 year shelf life. So this light is like my oh shit light. I keep it next to the bed. I maybe keep it in my pocket if I'm out. Um, keep one in my car. A lot of my, I, you guys saw me with my bag earlier with my uh, iPad bag. I keep one of these in it. And I'll usually put a knife on the other side. But again, you go out with a flashlight, no one's gonna think anything of it. This one's nice and small. I actually have another one that's even smaller that I carry too, but I want you guys to see this one. It's, uh, like I said, small, easy to carry. No one's gonna freak out if you have this. I'll tuck it, keep it in my back pocket. I had it out last night with me. And then all you gotta do is if I'm going somewhere where they're like gonna maybe look for things, I'll just untuck it and put it in my pocket and go, oh, yeah, it's a flashlight. And people just think it's like a little mini mag light or something. Even with the lights on, you can see how bright it is. It's pretty awesome. But that's why I wanted you guys to get used to it because at nighttime, it doesn't just get dark instantly. People get used to the darkness. They're in the bar for an hour or two. You know how it is when you get up in the middle of the night to go piss and you flip on the light, especially if you've been drinking or something, you flip on the light and you're like, oh man, like it fucking hurts. So imagine being able to do that whenever you want. Um, some of these lights, like I said, are pretty expensive. I really like this one. It's a Streamlight ProTac 2L. The other one is a 1L. That's usually the one I carry. It's just the three volt version. This is the six volt version. Um, these retail for like 60, 70 bucks. So they went from being, a couple years ago when I was teaching this full time, to 300 for some of the ones I have, to now 50, 60 bucks. Uh, the place I used to work at too back in the day is called Arizona Tactical. And what I'm gonna try to do with them is if any of the guys are here, wanna order the stuff, just Google Arizona Tactical. 
It's ArizonaTactical.com, and you guys can call them up and just say, hey, Steve, bravo. He showed us the flashlights, a small black LED one, and they said they'd try to give you guys a discount on it. I don't know for everyone who's watching this video years from now. I don't know if it's going to work for you guys, but for everyone in the near future, they said they'd try to hook you up. Just as something cool to do. Like, I don't get anything back from that. So 80% of shootings occur in low light. Some people have seen those flashlights that go on the guns, that mount on the bottom. Those are nice, but the problem is if I hear a noise, maybe I don't want to cover that with my muzzle yet. Maybe I'm not justified in pointing my gun at it yet. So instead of pointing my gun at everything and then I turn out it's like a kid or something in the house or some kid in your backyard and now I got my fucking gun on them, I could go out with my flashlight and be ready if I need to. And also they're blinding, they don't see anything. And like I said, um, when we were doing training, you'd keep it away from your body and they would actually shoot at the flashlight because they can't see you. Like right here, if he couldn't even see me, he couldn't fight. So you could just blast someone. I had some homeless guy come up to me one night acting really squirrely, getting up in my face, wanted some money, was drunk on something. And I was like, dude, I don't want any, like, stay away from me. He's like, ah, oh, give me something. Kept getting close. And I zapped him in the eyes with this, and he whipped his head back so fast that he stumbled and almost fell over just from that. And he's like, what the fuck was that? He's freaking out just from fucking shining a flashlight in his eyes. So, and I don't know if you guys noticed it, but when police officers do stops, they always kick on their high beams in the spotlight, and they blind you. That's, they're, they're doing that on purpose. They walk up, they shine the flashlight in your eyes right away, or they shine it at like a white piece of paper or something. It backlights you. Same thing. They're trying to fuck up your eyes on purpose, so that way if they have to get in a fight with you, they're already at an advantage. The other thing we used to teach was how to create a wall of light. So if all these headlights are on, eventually I'm going to have to cross this light, and I'm going to get backlit like this picture. See how you can totally see my silhouette if you're shooting at it? Well, if this is getting shined in your eyes, even if I'm backlit, you can't see me. I actually... For that picture, I had to hold it down because it was too powerful. It was too bright for that picture. So they would actually stop, create a wall of light with their headlights, their searchlights, and all that. Well, then as they're walking in front, they get their handhelds out, blind you, and then they can get right up on your car, and they don't, you don't even know they're there because they just it's white light until they're right on top of you. But like I said, something that you can carry with you all the time. Is it going to draw any weird looks? You can't get in trouble for blinding someone for a second with it. A flashlight. So... Knives are fun. I love them. I got lots. This is one of the ones I was carrying for a while. I'll show you guys some. It's called a karambit, and they do all these moves with it where you twirl it. Instead of like a ballet song knife where you flip it around, which really is like, back in the day, they used to try to flip it and hit someone's hand, like kind of disarm them or something with it. This is actually cool because if I'm trying to like reach someone and I can't make contact with it, I got to be careful. I don't cut the screen. But you want to reach out and you can't cut them, I can actually extend it, and now I can make contact with it. You can also twirl it around and actually get two cuts with one move. Because it's curved, it's actually, it's designed where it will puncture and everything that's caught in there as it cuts out, it'll sever. Any predator's teeth and fangs are shaped like this for a reason. So I'm a big fan of this knife, it's called a karambit. I'll talk more about that maybe on the break or something. I didn't want to start doing knife training and stuff on the video. But I'm a big fan of knives. But obviously, for defending myself, I don't want to get up close and fight with someone. And all it takes is one lucky shot and I can be knocked unconscious. I'd obviously always want to have space and have a firearm because that's going to be the best weapon. So creating space, you use a superior weapon. If I could use a shotgun, if I, was, if I knew I was going to get in a gunfight, I'd want a sniper rifle. So I'd want to be as far away as possible, as safe as possible, and never let them see me. If I had to be a little closer and someone's coming at me with a knife or a handgun, <clears throat> I'd want my shotgun or a rifle. If it's even closer, maybe a handgun, I didn't have enough time to prepare. I, don't, I always want to get into something with the best weapon I have. But you always have to balance that out. You don't want to be in level orange all the time when you go out and you can't relax. That was one of my problems. I could never relax. I was always the guy at the bar or the restaurant with my friends. Let's see if I can do it now without, making, like, without laughing. But I was always the guy that they're like, what's wrong? Why are you so angry? And I was like, I'm fine. <laughs> so it's hard for me to do now without even laughing. I had to teach myself how to do it. I was really bad. I had like a stone face all the time. But it was because of all this training that I did. And I, when I got divorced, I was like, man, i got to learn how to relax and actually act normal. And so I don't go out carrying a gun with three mags and all that stuff. And I never did that. But there's people that do it, and they take it that far. So you really have to balance this out with your life. Are you going to go out always with three guns and four knives and all that stuff? If I was going to war, how many guns would I carry? Guess. Number. Throw it out there. Three? I'd carry as many as I can. As many as I can effectively carry and utilize. That's what I'd carry. Knives, weapons, all that stuff. As many as I can. But if I'm just going to like Target, I was going to say Walmart, but I don't go to Walmart. I go to Target. Target. So if you want to be a little fancier and go to Target, I don't want to go out there with like five, six guns because I don't want my life 
You finally got it, Target. That's what we used to say in LA. Um, actually, man, Target in LA and Hollywood, that was like the hottest girls. You'd see celebrities and stuff. That was one of the best places to see them too. But you gotta balance out your life with all this stuff. Now, I don't have like crazy shit all in my house, but I definitely have access to a weapon in the bathroom, in the living room, at my desk or something. Because if someone kicks in that door all of a sudden, I don't want to have to then run and try to get something. I always just want to be around something. Um, if I'm in my car, I always have something around on me. I always have something. So, but if you guys look at me, I look like just a normal dude. And if I was in Arizona, I'd have my gun on me and no one would know. So you really got to figure out a way to balance this with your life. I didn't get into uh, any legal stuff because everyone is in from different states and there's different laws. Some places, like Arizona, if someone breaks in my house, castle doctrine, I'm in a domain. If someone breaks in my house, I'm in fear of my safety. I can defend myself. Other places, we used to do this as a demo in our uh, CCW class. Someone broke into a house. The guy was in his upstairs, and he ran into his basement with the gun. The guy chased him downstairs into the basement. He ended up shooting the guy. The guy was coming after him to fuck him up, to maybe kill him. He shot the guy. Well, then later, the guy who did the shooting, who was the homeowner, got in trouble because he didn't try to hop out the basement window and try to escape. So to me, that's fucking insane. That was one of the reasons I moved away from California, too, because it's just the laws. I, I can't defend myself. That's insane. But I always recommend to uh, whatever state you guys are in, either they have a book called the Arizona Gun Owner's Guide, and every year they update it. But this guy started writing the book for other places, too. So you might be able to buy his book and find the laws on lethal force. Otherwise, I'd try to go to the gun range and see if they have any guys there, maybe the CCW instructors, uh, law enforcement guys there, or a lot of times they have lawyers who help teach the classes. And then you can get a lawyer who's pro-gun who can then explain this stuff. Because the shit I've heard, people have asked me, well, what about this? What should I do in this situation? I'm like, are you in fear of your safety? Yes. And I'd shoot. That's really all it comes down to in Arizona. So everyone's different. Obviously can't talk liability-wise, so I always say just be careful. And even when I did my uh, CCW instructor course, it was taught through DPS, which is the state police in Arizona. And the head dude was running it, who's a cop, he said, even you guys here, if you guys ever get in a lethal force encounter and you end up having to use it, don't say anything. Don't even say anything, because anything you say can and, be will, can and will be used against you. He goes, even if it was a completely justified shoot, you could say something like, oh my God, I can't believe I shot him like 15 times. Like he kept moving, I kept shooting him, and I couldn't believe these hollow points, these new ones I got really fucking blew a hole in his head. It was crazy. Because you just fucking are in this crazy life or death situation. Adrenaline's pumping, you're not thinking straight. Maybe something like that comes out. He writes it in the report. Well, you're totally justified in that shoot. But later, the civil case, his family is like, why'd you have to kill my baby? And end up suing you later. And then he had cop killer bullets or human killer bullets or any of that stuff in it, too. So shut up. I would always say, too, like, I just had a life and death situation. I need to get checked out. I need to make sure I'm OK. And then talk to a lawyer. Protect yourself, which I think we were talking a little about legal stuff before. There's a really good video on YouTube where it's a, a, a college professor of law, and he gets on stage and does like a whole little 30-minute speech where he goes down the, all these laws of things that could be used against you. You imported a fish from another country. Well, part of the Constitution, part of all these amendments and everything is we honor laws of other lands. Well, that having that law as a fish is a, is a felony. Have this fish because it's like a protected fish. Well, now you can be charged with that in America, and it's this whole crazy thing. And right after him, he goes, okay, now there's a detective, a homicide detective, he gets on stage, he's like, let's see his point, and he gets up there and he goes, yeah, don't say anything, because anything we can get against you is going to be used against you. He goes, even if uh, you didn't do the shooting, there's cases of this where the guy, uh, they go, oh, so-and-so got killed, they think he did it, and he's like, no, I was, with my, I was at my mom's house that whole time. He's like, well, it's your mom, that's a bad alibi, so they throw that out the window. And then he goes, uh, during the statement, they go, well, I didn't kill him, I'm glad he's dead, but I didn't fucking kill the guy. So then later in court, they go, didn't you say that you're glad he's dead? And they can use that against you. You guys ever watch the show The Wire? Yes, that's one of the most amazing TV shows of all time. It was on HBO a while ago. Awesome. Very accurate with the law enforcement stuff. And there's a lot of scenes where they're trying to get the drug dealers there. They lie to them, they flip. Cops are allowed to lie to you about stuff too. So they lie, they try to get the guys to flip, but a lot of times you shut up. Especially, and I'm not saying do stuff illegal and then lie to the cops or whatever, but I'm saying if you're doing something like this, I just defended myself, I had to use a gun on someone Two minutes later, I don't want to start blabbing and talking about all this stuff. All right, three things I want to talk about for uh, follow-up reading, and then we're going to get into Q&A. So one thing I want to get into, and I didn't cover it here at all, but it's the OODA cycle. It's called the OODA loop. Um, it was written by, 
Colonel John Boyd, who people consider the best military strategist of all time, but a lot of people don't even know who he is. So I recommend reading as much as you can about this guy. It's fucking awesome. Uh, he went to the Air Force Top Gun School. I think the Top Gun School is like the Navy. And he went to the Air Force one. And it's a huge deal to be invited to go there. It's a huge deal to fucking graduate. And if you ever get invited back later to teach, that's insane. Well, he went through it, graduated. They asked him to stay and keep teaching. They used to call him 40-second boy. Within 40 seconds, he would let someone get on a six, and he would flip things around and always get behind him. He actually came up with a mathematical equation to show why the MiGs were smoking our F-14s, which is the top gun plane where the wings moved. So stupid. It's like get one plane to do a couple things shitty instead of one plane to do one thing well. He actually, uh, without a lot of people knowing, developed the F-15, which then became one of the 16 and the 18, which is the baddest shit out there. And his buddies that worked with him developed the A-10 Warthog, if you know about that, which is like the best ground support airplane there is. But a lot of people have never even heard of him. Um, during the first Desert Storm too, he was an advisor. It's Amazing stuff. OODA cycle. It's a thought process loop. Observe, orientate, decide, action. Whoever goes through that thought process loop first generally wins the engagement. And the whole time you're gathering information and operating, uh, updating your choices. And if you're already cycling through this and someone else is reacting, you guys have heard action is faster than reaction. That's, this is the b better breakdown. I got really into this stuff and that's why when I got into pickup, I picked things up so fast and so good because I already knew about stuff like this. OODA loop, just Google that. And you can also, I have a forum, my website's bravopua.com, but I have a free forum. And uh, I just added a section a little bit ago car, called the Armory, where we're talking about some guns and stuff. But it's like an off topic. It's, a lot of my guys are ex-military guys and stuff, so we talk about, about guns and gear and stuff. Um, but OODA loop, that's something I talk about. Just Google that phrase, read about it on Wikipedia, it's fucking awesome. On combat. That's a book I recommend you guys read. It was written by uh, Colonel Grossman, who also had um, On Killing, On Combat. Actually, On Combat and On Killing, those are good books. But he has this great post, and a couple people, we already talked about it. There's this great um, breakdown. I posted it in the Armory section of my site, where it's basically there's three types of people in the world. Sheep, wolves, wolves are the bad guys. Sheep, they're the civilians. Most of the people just, they don't care about anything. They don't worry about anything, and just hopefully no one comes in to attacks them. And then there's sheepdogs, which are usually military, law enforcement, the people who step up and will protect the sheep from the wolves that they need to. Great little breakdown because it talks about how the sheep, if the wolves haven't been around for a while, the sheep start looking at the sheepdogs and they don't like them because it reminds them that there's wolves out there. And the sheepdogs kind of look like a wolf. They have fangs, they kind of look like them. But when a wolf wants to attack a, pride, a, a group of sheep, it just takes one sheepdog to scare them off. So reading that, I say that's something every, every man needs to read and understand where you fall out in that category. And I'm not saying one's wrong and one's right. Well, being a wolf is wrong, but I'm not saying being a sheep is necessarily wrong, but it's not for me. Also, Gates of Fire. That's just like one of my all-time favorite books. And I think every man should read that. Basically, like the Battle of Demopoli, the 300 and all that. So I wanted to get to Q&A. I saw guys like earlier raise their hands and we're talking about some stuff. But I'm sure you guys have either had... Gun questions, things you've always thought about, any myths you guys want me to dispel, anything you guys want to cover, go for it, and let's get the microphone ready, whoever has questions. So who's up first? Red shirt. What would you say is Wait for Mike. What would you say is the, uh, the most practical martial art to <clears throat> take up, if you're going to take one up? What's the practic most practical martial art? I'm a big fan of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Um, one of my friends I taught with, he's in Afghanistan. He's overseas right now. Um, he was a red sash in Kung Fu. He was a black belt in Kimpo. He's a Silat instructor, which does Karambit stuff, Indonesian martial art. He was a Kali instructor too, which is the Filipino shit I was talking about earlier. He became a cop and he couldn't get almost any of it to work on resisting opponents, any of it. He started doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Carlson Gracie side. He got his blue belt and he said after he got his blue belt, all of a sudden all the other shit he started learning all those years, he was now able to do. The problem is most martial arts don't train realistically. And if there's not potential for you getting hurt, you're not trained hard enough, and it's a waste of time. So most, most schools, they train at like five or 10%. Like when I did Aiki Jiu Jitsu, it was like, okay, grab the head, we sweep them, and we throw them, and that's a neck break. I can never fucking practice that move, ever. So in the, in the heat of the battle, you don't rise to the occasion. You default to your training. So if you train here, that's all you're gonna be able to bring. If you train here, which is what I love about jiu-jitsu because you do an arm lock, tap, that's it. Well, if I need to, broken. 
chokehold, tap. Okay, he's out. If I need to, I hold on for a couple more seconds, he's unconscious. So the training is so close to real life. Um, and then when they did the old UFCs, jiu-jitsu destroyed everyone else. But it seems like a lot of guys who are in like kung fu and taekwondo and all that stuff, they're trying to like come back and go, oh, well, MMA is like a sport. Now, if I was in a bar fight with someone, I'd rather have Randy Couture or Anderson Silva in my corner than some old, fat, Elvis-looking dude who does like kicks boards and shit. So anyways, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And if you want to get more serious in it, boxing, kickboxing, do some gun training, and then I do some edge weapon, which is Kali. And I don't like a lot of the martial arts. Most of the ones that try to jam it all together, like the combative stuff, World War II combatives or all that, even Krav Maga, a lot of the stuff I've seen, they try to cram it all together and then they do, they do it all poorly. Right, so I'd rather do one thing and get good at it and then supplement to it later. And also too, we talked about too, because you're taller, I'd go boxing, kickboxing for some reach and uh, length for you. And as far as like, if you're gonna look for a good, like a good knife, what kind of investment should you be making into that? Um, good knives. Benchmade's a good brand. Spyderco's a good brand. Um, Columbia River's an okay one. Uh, this is a Blade Tech. It's made by 511 now, which makes all those cargo pants that all like those military guys and stuff wear. Uh, Microtech I like. I'm a big fan of Strider knives. That's the one I had yesterday. That was like a $400 folder. But Benchmade Spyderco's, you can get those for like 50, 60 bucks. But you want to think about, it. is it a tool that you're going to be cutting boxes open? I'm probably not going to be cutting rope and shit with this. It's mostly a self-defense one. And I also like this too because folders aren't that great because you have to open them and under stress, I'm gonna have to pop this open. It's kind of hard to do, but I like this because I can pull it out. And there's basically like a brass knuckle. If I get hit and my hand loosens up, that necessarily doesn't drop out of my hand. And it's also very good defensive because it's in close, you can cut and dig and it's really gonna fuck shit up. But I like it too because I can use it in a closed grip. And then just go out, go to the, don't buy the ones at like the knife mall, mart shit. That's all garbage stuff. Any of that stuff is $10, $20. And a lot of the locks, too, that's, that's a whole other talk. The locks, there's lockbacks with the locks on the outside. There's ones without locks, like the Swiss Army knives. And there's ones with the liner lock where it's inside. I like the liner locks, but you got to be careful because a lot of those are loose. So I like frame locks where it's actually part of the handle. The whole handle pops over, the one I had last night. So when you're gripping onto it, you actually reinforce the locking mechanism because you don't want it to close on you. Other questions? If you can't tell, I'm very passionate and knowledgeable about this stuff. I studied it for fucking years, and I joke that I even know more about this stuff than I do pickup. I'm pretty good at pickup. Um, I really appreciate this talk, and uh, but one of my friends, he recently got mugged, and he's the tactic he read on the internet. It's called, like, I mean, it's just, he just... Um, he just started, got mugged, and what? No, yeah, my friend got mugged, and he used this, um, like, the crazy tactic. The robber was kind of crazy. He was drunk or high or on something, but he pretended to be even more, like, crazy and just started, like self hurt like just started hurting himself and your friend did yeah and then the guy was like you just you just like completely threw him off balance and kind of like i don't want to mess with this guy he seems really more like even more fucked up or something what have you had an experience with like random encounters like that or i was gonna say for what your friend doing it's glad that it worked so it's yeah, hard for me I mean, yeah, it, I one of my problems is i, I never like critiquing or monday morning monday morning quarterbacking anything that worked right but my philosophy is instead of me like biting myself and going, ah, and pissing my pants, or like uh, Homer Simpson, he goes, cry like a girl and play dead, scream you have hemophilia. Yeah. And then he goes, then when he turns around, it's back kicking time. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> but he goes, uh, that's not my philosophy. So if someone does it, I'm aware of my surroundings first, so I never even let it get to that point. Okay. And I have had to draw my gun down once. I have pulled my knife out before. I have pulled my flashlight out and shined it. So even that, someone starts getting close, it's out. And I'm like, but it's also just being aware of your surroundings. There's one story where I was at the bar with a chick. If you guys go to my website, there's my little opt-in thing where you put in your email and there's this 30-minute inter interview I have with a chick. It's this hot Asian chick I picked up while she was working. It's funny, she's a, she worked in an apartment complex and I had her start calling around other places because I didn't want to live there, but I had her hunt out places for me. And then she was calling me going, go here, go here. And then we went out to dinner that night and she paid, it was pretty cool. But anyways, we were at a bar and she actually got into the stuff. She'd help me teach when we'd go out. She was like a wing girl. And um, we were at a bar one night, and all of a sudden the bouncers come running in. Like, because by the door, there's outside, and they all go running in. And I saw it, we're at the table, and she's in the middle of the story, and I'm just, because I'm in level yellow, I see them go running in, that got my attention, now I'm in orange, and I was like, you know what, because I, I know this place, I know the layout, this is like the exit right by us, we're at this table by, right by it. So all the bouncers had to go running in. I was like, you know what, stop talking for a second, let's get up and move. And she's like, well, no, let me finish my story. I was like, no, let's get up. And we got up, we walked about 10 feet away, and then all of a sudden, Five bouncers come bringing this, and they're all big. They bring out this fucking giant, like, ASU football player, and he's freaking out and fighting drunk. Boom, right into the table that we were sitting at. Everything goes flying. They end up going outside. 
And she's sitting there and she goes, how the fuck did you know that was gonna happen? I was like, oh, I just saw the bouncers go running in, so I figured there's probably a fight and I didn't want to be by the one door when they're dragging people out, because that's always what they want to do. If you watched Roadhouse, they always want to drag the guy out, the cooler. Um, love that movie, except for the rip throat at the end. That doesn't work in real life. Anyways, uh, so if I'm doing any of that, I went off on a tangent. But anyways, if I'm doing any of that, I'm aware of my surroundings first. That's number one. Okay. Second, someone starts coming up to me, well, I usually have something. So even beforehand, I might have it out in my hand ready. But freaking someone out, fucking with their head, they're looking for someone who's in level white, right. an easy target. So if you do anything to throw that off, and you're no longer going to be an easy mark, an easy victim, a lot of times that's all it takes, screaming, running, whatever. But in my situation, someone starts coming up to me, give me your money or whatever, hey, man, I don't want any trouble. And I would even try to like get my wallet out first and maybe like toss it on the ground or do something. Because 50 bucks or whatever I got on me right now, it's not worth a chance of me anything happening. But maybe when he's reaching for it, I'll pull out my knife. Or if he has something else, and then I reach down, I'm able to grab my gun. Or if I have it, then pull it out. But even then, I could still shoot him. I could shoot him three times. And he could pull out his gun and get one shot off. And that could kill me instantly, and he could live. Right. Um, so you never want to bet on anything. But being aware of your surroundings is number one. Never be in those situations. So. OK. And um, one last add-on to that. And going along with that, you think needles would be an efficient deterrent? Like if you had like a needle full of just blood, and you had pretended like you had AIDS or some crazy shit. And like, you I mean, they'd be like, I mean, that's just kind of like unexpected and just, all right, go for it. Why yeah, carry a like, needle in your pocket yeah, where you have to? They're not going to have um, like the pepper spray and whatever. So she's going to reach into her purse, pull out just the like, needle, pull out the hypodermic that she carries everywhere. I that's going to be filled, with, the, that's gonna be like, filled with Kool-Aid. She's going to pop the thing and go, I'll give you my fucking AIDS. Yeah, like the skill set for me to pull out pepper spray is like probably less complicated than this because she's probably not drilling it, so she's not used to pulling out the needle. But also, too, if I'm going to carry something, why not carry something that would actually work? Why waste this time, the space, the money, any of that stuff having something that's not really going to work? And also, too, this is also a moral choice too. And I worked at our range, and there was there was a couple suicides at our gun range when I was there, and I had to go out and get people off when like dead dudes laying there, and it all matters like how it affects you. I have no problem drawing down on someone. I have no problem doing whatever I need to do to defend myself and make sure I get home at night. Because it's not me going out deciding I'm gonna kill someone. It's their actions dictating my reaction. So if someone's coming to me and causing that level of reaction from me, then I have no problem doing whatever I have to do. Especially, a lot of times when I was doing private lessons at the range, we'd have like a, mo a soccer mom come in or something. She's like, I don't know if I could ever shoot someone. There's, I think there was one more question in the back behind. Oh, okay. Um, she goes, I don't know if I could ever shoot anyone. I was like, oh, do you have a kid? And they go, yeah. I go, how old are they? Five. And I was like, okay, so if the guy's in the house at night and he has a knife over your kid and you have a gun, what are you going to do? I'll blow his fucking brains out. And I was like, right. So you can do that to protect your kid, but you can't do that to protect yourself. And then also if you get raped and killed and your kid's in the house and they experience that, and they possibly get raped afterwards and then they have to grow up without a mom. And they're like, once you kind of start getting in that mindset. But to me, it's, I don't know, I just always thought this way. I was like, there's no way I'm ever going to let anyone Fuck with my shit and put me in harm's way. Okay, thank you. Thank no problem. But yeah, why, why do something half-assed? I'm going to do it. Do it for real. Can you elaborate a little bit on uh, the term OODA loop? I've heard that a few times before. I find it really interesting, but I don't quite get it. And also uh, how it applies to pickup, if it does. That's, I'm going to quickly go over it. Maybe on a break we can go a little bit more in depth. But I actually have it. So observe, orient, decide, act. I've seen a lot of like ebooks and all these brain process things where these guys like come up, make up the shit to explain it. And this is actually like real science. Like the guy is actually really, spit. like I said, he came up with a fucking mathematical equation to show why the MIG was better than our jets and why they fucked us up so bad. That's insane. So when you're in the observe, uh, observation phase, you're gathering information from old, unfolding circumstances, outside information, um, and also you can see how they're all looping back because you're always getting feedback from each step. The orientate, that's kind of like almost yellow, you're in orange, you're focusing on something and you're drawing from generic, uh, genetic heritage, uh, your previous training, cultural traditions. And this is when I'm teaching pickup, a lot of guys are like, oh, we don't talk to girls, like we don't do that where I'm from. Well, here we do, so it's, it's totally different. But that's where, that's where that information is coming into play. So then they're going into their decision phase and they're making a decision or a hypothesis and maybe when they get to this decision phase, the situation's changed, now they need to loop back and keep going through it until they get to their action phase. If you do this enough, if someone goes to choke me, 
I don't have to go through all these steps. You can see it actually skips because your body gets so good at perceiving these threats. Someone goes to choke me from behind, I don't have to go, oh, someone's checking me, what do I need to do? You instantly, I'll start grabbing and tucking my chin because it's just a reaction. So I did this, I got so good at like going in rooms and hostage rescue and having to process all this information very quickly, otherwise I get shot with simulations or paintballs and stuff and really fucking hurt. Um, I got so good at doing this that when I got in a pickup, I'd go out and I'd start perceiving all these things on girls. They'd wear a necklace that had a little yin yang symbol and I start, or a, the little namaste kind of thing and I'd just pick these things up. And I just thought like kind of everyone did this stuff because I started getting into guns when I was 19 and I was like, oh, this is what most people do. So I just got good at reading the situations and I have people thinking like I'm psychic and stuff, but I'm like, well, no, I saw like what you were wearing earlier or you said this and I thought, okay, why did they use this word unless they have this job? And I read a lot too. Like I get on the internet and just something grabs my attention. I start reading all over the place. So I'm always drawing new information in. Um, so anyways, with this, I have seen... Robert Greene, Art of Seduction, 48 Laws of Power, 33 Strategies of War. He wrote a blog post about this once and was talking about OODA Loop and Colonel John Boyd. But I just recommend getting on it. You can actually pull up. He used to do briefings at the military just on this. It was like hours and stuff. And you can actually just find this stuff for free on the internet. It's better than I'm going to say it. But what I would recommend is Googling Ken Good, OODA Cycle, and it's called Got a Second. And it was something that was the guy I did the Surefire class with. And basically he breaks it down where at the end... He goes, um, the decision, uh, the acting phase is the, is the easiest. It's all the other stuff before it that's the hard stuff. So his example is a fighter pilot. Getting behind the guy, getting your sights locked on him, getting in that perfect position, that's all the hard stuff. Hitting the button, acting, releasing the missile, shooting him, that's the easy part. So it's all the other stuff. So just kind of, it's like NLP when you know the four levels of learning. Once you understand that stuff, it just helps out a lot because you're familiar with it. Oh. Okay, last question. And then I'm also here tomorrow, too. I'm going to teach an uh, online game tomorrow, so I'll go into PUA mode. But in between now and then, too, if you guys have any questions or anything like that. Except for martial arts, don't try to show me stuff and show me chokeholds. Like, that's the only thing I get sick of. But anyways, go. Um, actually, obviously, through your uh, PUA training and the, the combat training, you've become very aware of your surroundings. Like, it's probably like a natural thing. You know mm -hmm. where exits are. You know who's wearing this. So what would you recommend as a, a training mechanism for us, maybe when we're out and about, to increase Great question, awareness? great question. Actually, close your eyes real quick. How many people are in the row to you on the left? On the left? In the same row. There's, uh, I believe, four. Open your eyes and check. Two. <laughs> so that's how you drill it. Go out to places. And actually, there was that one movie with uh, Brad Pitt and... Robert Redford, I think, where he became like a CIA spy or whatever, and they got busted. It was an okay movie. But there's a good little drill of that where he opens the fridge, and he closes it, and he goes, okay, what's in there? And he goes, starts lighting. And he goes, oh, there's milk. And he's like, what's the due date? And he goes, it expired last week. And it was like literally like that. That's those kind of things, just going into an area. And I do this for demos. Now that I had you do it, it's kind of cheating. If I close my eyes and go, okay, you're wearing a black hoodie. There's two guys here. He has facial hair. He's wearing a green shirt. Um, someone just walked out of the building. Um, Ehrman, who's the announcer, is wearing a black button-up shirt, black t-shirt, dark slacks, loafers. Anthony's wearing his uh, polo shirt, striped pants, brown, five-toed, Vibram shoes. So that's just me being aware of all those things. I'm just processing that information. Animal earlier, red shirt we were talking about. So just things like that, just being aware of it. But a lot of times, like, I'm just absorbing it. I'm not even aware of it. But you got to start programming yourself to do that. So as you go out, do that with games. And when I'd go out with martial arts guys, that's what we do. We go, close your eyes. How many people are at the table behind you? And you just do little things like that. Then you start picking things up and you're just aware of more things. And like you said, always being aware of your surroundings. Close your eyes. Where are the two exits here? How many steps are there on the bench? What, uh, how many slideshows did I have? How many slides did I have? Another thing I did in that Surefire class, he'd do demos where he would go over here, talk for a second, and he'd come back. And he'd go, okay, how, how long did that take for me to do that just now? Tell me. Yeah, that walk to right here, how long did it take? For you to walk there, over there, back, uh, three seconds. Okay. See, actually, it was probably like 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, pretty close. But the thing is, no one ever thinks like 1.2 seconds. This is the way our, our minds and brains work. We always try to like keep things simple so you don't ever try to get really focused. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking like, oh, this guy's maybe taller than me. You don't know. Well, how tall? Try to be very specific with it. And just being aware of that's like step one, then testing yourself. But we do that and just drill it and go, okay, how many guys are behind you? When I go out, I'm always looking. Like I saw the knife yesterday in the back pocket. Your back right pocket, it was a silver clip and there's some holes in it. 
and it was a green handle. And I said, oh, what kind of knife is it? I thought it was a Severtech. He said it was a SOG. He pulled it out. There's a thumb stud on it, SOG. It's silver, and it's a clip point blade. And I saw it last night for like two seconds, and I can just remember that. So it's just practicing. Your brain gets used to doing this. But because I was already good at this beforehand, then once I got in the pickup, and that's why a couple months later, after I met Style, then I was working for him. And then for four or five years, I was like his head coach and all that stuff. So that helped. Cool, we go with the questions. All right, guys, hope you guys enjoyed the gun talk. Obviously, you can tell I'm very passionate about it. So if you guys have any more questions, I'm here till tomorrow afternoon. Happy to help as much as I can. Thank you. <laughs>